Tonight, uh, Dr. Sachs will be talking about his latest book, Musicophilia, Tales of the Brain and Music. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Oliver Sachs. Thank you for that very charming introduction, Dr. Garib. I was uh, particularly touched that my grandfather, my luminous grandfather and uncle and so forth, got into it. Um, it's uh, a delight being here on um, this paradisal day, and it, it reminds me of the first day I came to California in 1960 and why I wanted to stay um, and stay forever. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course Marin County is not only full of physical beauty but is, is rich in culture as well and it has some um, independent bookshops yeah. like, like Book Passage um, uh, and in New York which ought to be the capital of culture independent bookstores have almost vanished um, now, I, I come from a fairly musical family. Um, incidentally, I'm getting uh, I'm, I'm almost too much reverberation from this. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, um, I think that's better. I was getting a bit too much feedback. C can you all hear me up there? Okay. Um, well, I, I'm one of the less musical members of a musical family. Um, my father uh, was intensely musical. He always had little miniature scores in his pockets and between seeing patients uh, and at traffic lights, he would sort of pull out a score and it would, and it would play in his mind. Um, he really had very little use for record players. Uh, he, he had a, a very superior one in his brain. Um, my mother, on the other hand, had difficulty uh, producing a tune, although she was fond of music, and I'm somewhere in between. Um, but at least I esteem music, unlike William James, who in the 1500 pages of his Principles of Psychology has only a single sentence, and that a little dismissive about music. Uh, or musical susceptibility, as he said. He writes, it has no zoological utility. <laughs> it corresponds to no object in the natural environment. It's a pure incident of having a hearing organ, just so with a susceptibility to seasickness. <laughs> um, and, um, but I think that's a bit hard on music, although this is echoed a bit in our time by Steven Pinker, who's referred to music as auditory cheesecake. Um, you know, as something really a luxury. And Pinker has said, what benefit could there be to diverting time and energy to making plinking sounds? Perhaps he means pinking sounds, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, as far as biological cause and effect are concerned, music is useless. It could vanish from our species and the rest of our lifestyle would be virtually unchanged. Well, I don't think I agree with that. Um, I, um, I think most of us have a, a real need for music. Um, and certainly you find music exists in the central in every culture known to us. Um, I was going to say with one exception, but that's an anti-culture, which is the Taliban, who forbid music, as Plato forbade music in his academy. Um, and their musical instruments, bone flutes and things, going back 50,000 years. And so um, music is obviously, um, we don't have a time machine, but it's clearly in some form or another been central in, in human culture, probably in human evolution, for, for a very long time. Um, there are a, 
I, I, I like my own little bottle. You know, people misunderstand if it's in a brown paper bag. <laughs> I, it's, um, you know, uh, uh, well, one becomes very attached to these things. You know, psychiatrists talk about transitional objects. They're, they're you know, like, like, like teddy bears and cushions and rag dolls and things. Um, now, um, uh, um, however, um, James is certainly right in saying that people vary a good deal in musical susceptibility, and probably about 5% of the population are somewhat tone deaf or have a tin ear. Um, this doesn't prevent them from loving music and sometimes from bawling lustily in the bath uh, to the distress of others. Um, I, I was actually partly, um, I don't know whether this is the right thing to say in a, a Dominican university, um, I was partly driven away from religion myself um, many years ago when the cantor in our, we, in our local synagogue was totally tone deaf, well, almost totally, um, and yet he fancied himself very much, and in, in cantillation, there are certain elaborate forms of cantillation where you go on a sort of tonal excursion um, with, with little twists and frills all over the way. It requires a good ear, and you come back to the tonal center, you come home, except when he came back it would be half an octave away or more. <laughs> and, um, and, and I think sometimes with an expression resembling that famous Munch painting of the scream, I, I would rush out in a, in a sort of a state of acoustic agony and, and, and I never went back. Um, the, um, but, uh, now, excuse me, I have a slight cold, and I, I don't want to blast your ears with, with a, a hugely amplified sneeze. Um, um, however, um, there are also states of absolute amusia, as it's sometimes called, when people cannot recognize any tune and, and really don't even have the concept of music, of a melody. I encountered this first in a colleague of mine, a, a distinguished French neurologist called Lermite, and he told me that if he heard music, he could either say it was the Marseillaise or it wasn't. <laughs> uh, um, beyond this, he, and unfortunately, I forgot to ask him how he could tell it was the Marseillaise, although I suspect he would have said that people stood to attention or, or saluted or whatever. Um, but I think, um, now this, this book of mine, uh, in a way, is, it's both narrow and broad. It's narrow in that it basically comes from clinical experience. These are stories which I've got from my own patients or from people who've written to me, sometimes for my friends, sometimes for that matter, for my own experience. Um, on the other hand, there's a range of things, but I want to read you something. Uh, about a, um, a charming lady in the Bronx uh, who has this condition of amusia. Um, uh, her recollections go right back to early, humiliated and puzzled recollections go back to early life when children of four or five would be asked to get up and sing their names. And she didn't know how to do it and she didn't know what the other children were doing. I mean, their posture seemed strange and their facial expression, but that was as much as she could say about the odd noise which came out of them. Um, then uh, there was a music recognition class, and she said various pieces were played, including the William Tell Overture. She couldn't distinguish them. Uh, her father got a, um, uh, a record player, an old Victrola, and records of the five pieces didn't help. She listened and listened, and um, it was of no use. Uh, he also got her a little toy piano, which could be played by numbers, and she learned to play Mary Had a Little Lamb and Frère Jacques, but had no sense that she was producing anything but noise. And she said that if others played, she couldn't tell if they made a mistake. If she played, she could tell whether she'd made a mistake, but only by the feeling in her fingers, not by hearing anything. And she came from a very musical family, and her mother in particular um, accused her of having something against music. Uh, 
it's not good to be accused and this accusation sort of was really with her for much of her life and she did her utmost um, to enjoy music. She, um, she went to concerts, she would be invited to musicals, um, although she said the experience for her was somewhere between unintelligible and excruciating. <laughs> I, I said, why excruciating? You know, what, what is your experience if music is played? And she said, if you go into the kitchen and throw the pots and pans on the floor, that's what I hear. And I was sort of appalled at this. Um, she'd been tested as a child, and it was found that she really could not tell uh, that she was pitch deaf to an extreme degree. Um, notes would have to be half an octave apart or more for her to distinguish them. And this meant she couldn't hear semitones or tones. She lacked the building blocks of music, of a scale, of melody. Um, she said she'd been wistful sometimes, but she could see how much meaning and pleasure music could have for others. And she would sometimes dream or have fantasies that she could suddenly hear it. She said she imagined it would be like someone totally colorblind suddenly seeing color for the first time. Um, now, her perception of voices, or rather of what people said, was perfectly normal and she was fond of going to poetry readings and going to the theater and she could hear ambient noises sort of birds singing sinks gurgling dogs barking whatever and this gave rise to suspicion if she'd been totally deaf that would have been okay but they said how can you be deaf to music and nothing else but this is the nature of amusia and it's because the you know, music doesn't exist in the outside world any more than pain or color. It is put together by the brain. And it's a very, very complex thing because different parts of the brain deal with pitch and rhythm and melodic contour and timbre. And there's something like 30 different parts of the brain are involved in constructing music. And one, uh, uh, in the late 90s, um, Dolores, this lady, saw an article in the New York Times about some workers in Canada who seemed to be dealing with something similar. And she said to her husband, that's what I've got. I'm going to contact them. She contacted the people in Canada and they examined her and they told her three things which were very important. They said, first of all, it's not that you have anything against music. It's that you have a little anatomical anomaly in your brain, a little part of the brain is missing in part of the right frontal lobe and this is why you can't hear music. Now many people with unusual conditions suffer from the feeling first that they're a fraud or, or that it's emotional and her mother had said this but here she found no it was neurological which made it morally okay. Second she said am I the only person in the world like this? And they said, no, there were few others. And they introduced her to some of the others, if you want, her brothers and sisters in amusia. And this again was a great relief because if one feeling is that one is a fraud, the second feeling is that one is unique. And thirdly, they said to her, you don't have to go to concerts. <laughs> they said, if your husband wants to take you along, say, you go. I'll go to the movies. And um, she said she only wished she had been given this advice when she was seven rather than 70. Um, but um, having told you something of Dolores' story, I want to stress that this is extremely rare, this sort of absolute amusia, and that 99.9% .9 of the population certainly have you know, although they may be a little tone deaf or whatever, um, they have a vivid feeling of music and for music. Um, the feeling of music and for, by feeling of music, I mean of the complex tonal and rhythmic patterns in music and of the melody. And then there's the feeling for music, music's mysterious power to elicit emotions, moods, states of mind,
which are of great profundity and beyond language and sometimes beyond, beyond experience. Um, there's this paradox about music that it is so abstract, it doesn't contain information, it doesn't represent anything, you can't have a musical bottle or a musical microphone, but, but music can tear at your heart and can, can, can give you ecstasy, anguish, uh, it can invigorate you, it can give martial feeling, it can give religious feeling, it's solemn feeling. Every emotion in the world can be mirrored in music. Um, I mentioned that a little bit uh, that Dolores had a little um, abnormality in her brain. Um, incidentally, um, I should say that she had a very good brain in all other ways. She, um, you know, in a very full life, she was a very good teacher, loved poetry, an active woman, um, although sometimes a little wistful about music. Um, a lot of work has been done on the, what the brains of musicians are like and the effects of music on the brain. Uh, this has especially been done by uh, uh, a man at Harvard called Schlaug, Gottfried Schlaug. Um, and using MRI, using a form of brain imaging, uh, he has shown really quite remarkable differences between the brains of musicians and non-musicians. Uh, what's called the corpus callosum, a great band which goes between the two hemispheres, is enlarged in musicians. Parts of the auditory cortex are enlarged. Uh, um, and interestingly, uh, a lot of the motor brain is enlarged as well. Um, I think I prefer you not to photograph me. Thanks. Um, because I'm self-conscious enough as it is, you know, and I feel I would I really sort of have to have to pose. Uh, you know, I prefer to be a voice, just a voice. Um, where was I? Um, uh, I'd forgotten where I was. I'm sorry, I got distracted by, <laughs> um, by the photography. Schlaug, yeah. Um, the, um, uh, um, uh, um, children spontaneously respond to music and to rhythm in movement. You see children dance, whether, whether to, a, to an outer music or to inner music. And this occurs universally in human beings. Um, interestingly, it even occurred in Dolores, who was sensitive to rhythm, although not, not to pitch. Um, it doesn't occur spontaneously in any non-human animal. Um, one suspects that something like this must, um, which really has no equivalent in speech. I mean, there isn't a regular pulse in speech as there is in music. But human being, but uh, all human beings react to this pulse, and one suspects that very, very early people danced together, sang together, and that beat formed a great synchronizing power, maybe in human society, and, and, and sort of, and has survived for that reason. Um, so then, um, and even if people are not making external movements to music, the motor parts of the brain are responding to music. And unique to the human brain again are anatomical connections between the auditory parts of the brain and the motor parts of the brain, as well as unique connections between the auditory parts of the brain and the emotional parts of the brain. So all of us are, are move, moved to music and are greatly moved to music. This seems to be built into the human condition. It's not clear that any non-human animal is, is moved in the same way. Um, now, interestingly, you can, uh, one, one wonders how much of these, so if you look at brains, as I say that actually, I remember my former anatomy teacher who lived in Mil Mill Valley. He was a wonderful old man called Gerhard von Bonin, and he would drive into San Francisco when he was well over 90 in his tiny Volkswagen every day and do brain slicing. I'm sorry, that sounds a little grim. Um, but even looking at brains, you can't look at a brain and say, this is the brain of a visual artist, this is the brain of a writer, this is the brain of a mathematician. But you can look at a brain and say, this is probably the brain of a musician. 
uh, and even with the naked eye, with the enlarged corpus callosum and many other things. And this shows both the power of music and the plasticity of the brain. The brain is visibly altered by music, and even a year of intensive musical training, like the Suzuki method, will alter the brain considerably. Um, well, once the musical networks are set up, once one, uh, um, then they're very robust. And even in something like advanced Alzheimer's disease, where so many other abilities to recognize and respond have gone, the ability to recognize and respond to music, and if the person is musical, to create music, stay almost to the end. And I think I want to read you a little more now about um, another patient or subject, I should say. Um, his, his daughter wrote to me, I, I get literally thousands of letters a year, and although I can't answer them all, I love the ones which just generously share experience. And, uh, and you know, my own practice in New York is tiny, but, uh, but this sort of correspondence sort of enlarges it. Incidentally, in the acknowledgments to my book, I have 162 acknowledgments to correspondence. Um, now, one of them then was um, uh, Mary Ellen Geist, who was a writer, and she wrote to me about her father, Woody Geist. She said that he had developed Alzheimer's 13 years earlier, um, and that he was now in bad shape. He, she said, he can't remember much of anything about his life, but he remembers the baritone part to almost every song he has ever sung. He has performed with a 12-man a cappella singing group for almost 40 years. Music is one of the only things that keep him grounded in this world. He has no idea what he did for a living, where he is living now, or what he did 10 minutes ago. Almost every memory is gone except for the music. And she went on to say that shortly before that, he had performed in the uh, RKO Music Hall. Um, the evening he performed, he had no idea how to tie a tie. He got lost on his way to the stage, but the performance, perfect. Um, well, I was fascinated by this, and, um, and then uh, when Woody and his family came to New York, I saw them in my office, and it was a sort of wonderful musical consultation because they, they all sang together. Um, at first, Woody seemed rather normal, I mean, he was um, quite well-dressed, and he had a, a neatly folded New York Times under his arm. Um, I subsequently found that, in fact, he had had to be dressed, and they had no idea that it was a New York Times, or for that matter, what a newspaper was. But the, the posture, the performance, the demeanor was quite normal. I mean, in a similar way, I was told he'd been a, a really a very good tennis player. He no longer knew what the word tennis racket meant, nor if he saw a tennis racket would he recognize it. But if he was on a tennis court and they put a racket in his hand and a ball came towards him, he'd immediately move into action. So this was a man, in a way, who had lost events. He'd lost his autobiography. He'd lost the story of his own life. He'd also lost a great deal of general information, but he didn't have facts, but he had acts. He had performances, and uh, uh, the ability to perform musically uh, will stay with one almost whatever happens. And this is partly because um, the sort of memory which is involved here, which psychologists call procedural memory, um, uh, is largely vested in very primitive parts of the brain and the cerebellum and the basal ganglia and so forth. And even if the superficial parts of the brain, even if the cerebral cortex is almost wiped out, those parts of the brain remain. And, um, you know, I, I, I think of them uh, really as, as sort of a, as a treasure house, uh, a bank where all sorts of procedures uh, can be locked away and remain one 
um, you know, available for life. I'd recently actually seen a very, a very eminent actor with amnesia. Again, very lost in daily life, but his consummate acting skills and his, you know, and his repertoire, which includes most of Shakespeare, that's, that's all available. Um, when Woody sang, when this actor acts, they appear and they feel virtually normal. And so in, in this sort of situation, you, um, you know, um, Proust describes waking in an unfamiliar room and being bewildered at first, not knowing where one is or who one is. And how then he says, memory will come down will come like a rope let down from heaven to sort of... Now, no such autobiographic rope is available for a Woody, but Woody becomes himself in performance. Um, uh, music therapy uh, is very crucial for many sorts of patients. Um, actually, I was speaking to one of you earlier this evening, uh, a lady who is a harp therapist, and uh, this reminded me of David and Saul. Um, but for even people who are more... Oh, I forgot to say one other thing about, about Woody, which, which very much charmed me. I asked him how he was, and he... Oh, if I can find it. Um, uh, anyhow, he, um, he said... Um, oops. Can't find, can't find what I want. Um, uh, he said he was fine, um, and this reminded me very much of what's recorded of Emerson, who became quite demented in his 60s, and people would ask him how he was, and he would say, I have lost all my mental faculties, but I'm perfectly well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, one, 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 one wishes that you know, Alzheimer's now and dementia you know, is so pathologized and, and so associated with stigma and shame and mortification, and it's sort of lovely to hear this sort of serenity and humor, which, which Woody, I think, also had. Um, but um, in some of the hospitals and old age homes where I work, and I've worked for more than 30 years with the Little Sisters of the Poor, who have homes all over the country, including a wonderful home in San Francisco, down on Lake. Um, but there um, you see sometimes deeply demented people who are, who are really not only very out of it, but, but who are agitated, who may be tormented, or who are just empty and isolated. And if a music therapist comes in, if music comes in, suddenly there's animation, there's attention, heads turn, and then, especially with familiar songs, people start to join in. And these familiar songs, music has a, a mnemonic power and an emotional power which is unique. Um, or perhaps it's only matched by, by smells, and you can't bring in smells in the same way. Um, so music is tremendously important for populations like this. Although for myself as a neurologist, I first encountered the power of music with a very different population. Um, I'm getting too hot, so I need to... Okay, sorry. <laughs> All your women are after you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Um, um, uh, Back in the mid-60s, I encountered the deeply Parkinsonian patients I later described in Awakenings. These were people who would often be transfixed or frozen in motion, uh, completely motionless, unable to initiate a movement or syllable, but given music, they could dance, they could sing, they could talk, they would be liberated from their Parkinsonism as long as the music lasted. And it was astounding to see this, and again they would come to a halt almost in mid-bar if the music stopped. Um, at that time I knew the poet W.H. Auden and I once took him along to see this phenomenon um, partly because he himself was very musical. He'd written the libretto to the magic flute and many operas 
and also because his, his father, George Auden, had been a pioneer describer of such patients in England in the 1920s. And when Auden saw this, he was amazed, and he quoted an aphorism of Novalis, which says, every disease is a musical problem, and every cure is a musical solution. I mean, that, that, that's almost too pat to be true, but it seemed to, to nail it with these Parkinsonians. Um, with them, whereas with the people with dementia, music has to be familiar and evoke memory and mood, this is not the case with the music for people with Parkinson's. It doesn't have to be familiar or evoke memory or mood, but it needs to have rhythm. It needs to have a well-marked rhythm. And, uh, and the essence of its power lies in this because people with Parkinson's who have dam damage in what's called the basal ganglia of the brain cannot generate rhythm for themselves. They cannot generate an orderly succession of movements or anything or thoughts. And, uh, and basically music in a way substitutes for the basal ganglia there for a little while. Um, a, a different power of music um, which has really only been strongly confirmed in the last couple of years or so, although it's been sort of tried by music therapists for many decades, has to do with restoring speech or language to people who have aphasia, who've lost expressive language from strokes, brain injuries, or whatever. Um, uh, such people may be mute, may be unable to say anything, but they can usually sing. And not only sing, but sing the lyrics in a song. And this in itself can be very reassuring to them because it shows that language is still there somewhere, even if it's sort of locked or embedded in music. And the question is then whether one can disembed it and use it to teach other parts of the brain language. And um, this is very labor intensive. This takes dozens and dozens of hours of very intensive therapy, but it may in fact be possible to teach someone whose speech area, whose broker's area, as it's called, and the left frontal lobe has been destroyed through music. It may be possible to teach the right side of the brain, which is normally nonverbal, uh, good, quite good enough language for quite detailed conversation. And it's amazing to see this. And here, of course, this is not an on-off effect, as to some extent it is with Parkinson's and even Alzheimer's. Um, here, music has made possible a great relearning and re reorganization in the brain. Um, so as, as a physician uh, in hospitals where there are many elderly people who have Parkinson's or dementia or strokes, I see a great deal of music therapy. Um, I also encounter what I might call the not so good power of music. Um, and I think this especially relates to uh, the fact that virtually all of us um, have tunes running through our head. I think even people like my mother who can't on command sing a tune she had tunes going through her head. I think most of us do, and sometimes was not even aware of it. You sometimes you suddenly realize that something has been playing for the last half an hour in your head. Um, now, the, the tunes which play in one's head, um, you know, may be stimulated by something one hears, something one sees, something someone has said, a memory, a mood. Um, it usually has some meaning and some relevance to one. Um, or it may go with, with activities. Um, I mean, I know for myself, I'm very fond of swimming and in freestyle with a one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I may start with a sort of counting, but then it turns into a Strauss waltz. <laughs> I, 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 I swim to Strauss. Um, certainly as I say that, I'm reminded of something which Leibniz, the philosopher, once said when he said, music is counting, but counting unconsciously. And, um, the, uh, and uh, a, a lot of athletes either sort of have iPods or mental iPods 
uh, you know, um, music which will coordinate, which will synchronize, which will invigorate um, the right sort of music. Um, sometimes the sometimes it's rather mysterious as to why some music has come into one's head and, and it may then um, then one has to go to one's analyst to find out. <laughs> um, in New York we all have analysts. Um, no, uh, and of course, uh, as you know, in, in, in Proust, sort of music and a little musical phrase of Van, Van Tilly winds through the whole structure of, of, of the story. Music and smell as the, as the great mnemonics. But sometimes um, this... Um, uh, so first I want to say our brains, for whatever reason, are very disposed to musical imagery and to musical activity. And sometimes this can become pathological. And typically then, um, what starts as normal, relevant musical imagery becomes maddeningly repetitive and goes on and on and on and on in a loop. And it may be music which means nothing, it may be music one hates and one has difficulty stopping it. Um, I th let me give you another little bit of description, this time not from a patient but from a, a friend of mine, uh, a young friend who was at school at the time, and he said he had been fixated on the song. I don't know any of these songs. I, I only know classical music, but you all know them, some of you. He had been fixated on the song Love and Marriage, <laughs> a tune written by James Van Heusen. A single hearing of the song, a Frank Sinatra rendition, used as the theme song of a television show, Married with Children, was enough to hook him. He, quote, got trapped inside the tempo of the song, and it ran in his mind almost constantly for ten days. <laughs> with incessant repetition, it soon lost its charm, <laughs> its, its lilt, its musicality, and its meaning. It interfered with his schoolwork, his thinking, his peace of mind, his sleep. He tried to stop it in a number of ways, all to no avail. I jumped up and down. I counted up to a hundred. I splashed water on my face. I tried talking loudly to myself. And anyhow, then it faded after about ten days. But when he told me about this, it came back and, <laughs> and haunted him again. Um, now, um, uh, People in the music industry, apparently in Germany in the 1970s and 80s, spoke of Ohrwurm, forgive my accent, which means earworm, although I prefer to call these brainworms. One also speaks of catchy tunes, of, of sticky music, and um, this is especially exploited uh, in commercials and theme shows. Um, where, and there's been a lot of what one wants to call malignant research. Um, to find out the particular qualities of a, of a melody or a theme which will hook people and render the brain helpless. Um, and, and indeed, if one does you know, functional brain imaging while someone has a brain worm, you can actually see a sort of vortex of, of electrical activity going on. This is... Um, uh, um, all, all forms of imagination, or imagery I should say, whether it's musical imagery or visual imagery, can activate the brain in the same way as perception. And, um, but here with brain worms you see a particularly monotonous sort of activity going on and on, which, which is what the experience consists of. Um, I suspect that most of you have had brain worms. Um, I suspect they're much commoner than they used to be. Um, there was a um, uh, um, th there's a lovely description in a Twain story from the 1870s of a of a brain worm, of a jingle which gets into someone's uh, the person finds his, himself moving to the jingle, um, and then he he mentions it to his priest. He confesses. And the priest, in turn, is infected with the, with the jingle. And then the, the priest describes this to his congregation one Sunday. 
uh, and the entire congregation gets turned on. Now, uh, people have spoken here of, of, of infectious musical viruses. Um, uh, I wonder whether with the ubiquity of music now, I mean, not only you know, are so many people plugged in all the while, but in at least in New York and every sort of shop and mall and bar and restaurant, you, um, you're bombarded with music and you can't close your ears. And you can't ask for it to be lowered or turned off because people will take this as an insult to their creativity or whatever. They, they, um, I, um, as an aside, I, um, I have very mixed feelings about iPods um, on the one hand, it's, 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 it's a, a miracle that one can bring, as it were, the whole classical repertoire, the whole planetary repertoire of music in something the size of a matchbox and have it conveyed with wonderful fidelity straight into the brain. Um, on the other hand, there's a danger of um, uh, the music being too loud, especially if it's used to blot out the environment. And there's been a real incipient epidemic of juvenile deafness. You, know, you can't, things which are that loud destroy the little hair cells. And the other is, uh, again in New York, 90% in the village where I live, 90% of the people are, I mean, they all look as if they're hallucinating. Um, uh, they're either on cell phones or looking at things um, or or, or completely enveloped uh, in, in music. And they, um, I have a particular animus here because um, about six months ago and when I was riding my bicycle, there was someone with earphones and I rang my bell, wasn't heard. I have a loud klaxon, wasn't heard. I also wear a police whistle. And none of this, and, and then she walked in front of me and I had to jam on the brakes and I went over the handlebars. And she said, she said, I'm sorry. She said, I didn't hear you. She said, are you okay? I, I was, blood was coming out of my mouth. She said, would you like a Tylenol? Um, <laughs> anyhow, um, fortunately, no bones were broken and I'm not paraplegic. But I feel I could have been and that it would have been the fault of an iPod. Or rather, of, of I, an iPod, which is too loud. But anyhow, I want to speak of one other condition, which... Um, I think sort of um, earworms are universal. I think this has to do with the, uh, with the, just the susceptibility of the, of the brain to playing and replaying music and in a way which it can't stop. Rarer than this is um, our musical hallucinations. Now, a hallucination is not like imagery. Um, uh, people are very startled if they have a hallucination, a musical hallucination. Hey, you hear that? What's that? They, they look around. They try and find the source of the music. And then reluctantly and bewilderedly, if they can't find an external source, they begin to realize that something is going on in their brain or mind. Um, uh, let me read you again a description, again from a letter, but again from someone whom I subsequently saw. Um, a charming and creative woman of 70 who wrote about this. She said, it started last November when I was visiting my sister and brother-in-law one night. After turning, off, after turning off the TV and preparing to retire, I started hearing Amazing Grace. It was being sung by a choir over and over and over again. I checked with my sister to see if they had some church service on TV, but they had Monday night football or some such. So I went onto the deck overlooking the water. The music followed me. I looked down on the quiet coastline and the few houses with lights and realized that the music couldn't possibly be coming from anywhere in that area. It had to be in my head. So. You know, I have literally had hundreds of letters from people with musical hallucinations, and this sort of course, you know, is the case with all of them. Um, anyhow, and then she, she went on, she included what she called her, her playlist. Um, 
But, um, usually, a musical hallucination will start with one hymn or song. It's always something from early life. Um, may not be something which people have ever consciously attended to or liked, but it's something they've heard. The music is always familiar. Um, and then it's liable to be joined by other things. Um, typically, um, I had one correspondent who wrote to me about his intracranial jukebox. Um, no, the metaphors sort of mirror the technology of the time. People in the 1890s complained of a music box, and then people complained of record players and radios and jukeboxes. Now, of course, they, they have iPods in the head. Um, uh, typically, with his intracranial jukebox, he couldn't turn it off. He could sometimes switch from one selection to another, provided there was some similarity of, of melody or rhythm or theme. And it's some, anyhow, so Mrs. B, her playlist beside Amazing Grace included the Battle Hymn of the Republic, Beethoven's Ode to Joy, the drinking song from La Traviata, <laughs> a tisket, a tasket, and what she called a really dreary version of We Three Kings of Orient are. <laughs> and then she went on, she said, one night I heard a splendidly solemn rendition of Old MacDonald Had a Farm, <laughs> followed by thunderous applause. <laughs> At that moment, I decided that as I was obviously completely bonkers, I better have the matter looked into. Um, well, she did have the matter looked into. Uh, and um, now, I think um, about 80 to 90% of people with musical hallucinations have moderately severe deafness. And sometimes the hallucinations will come on with a further loss of hearing, and, and rather suddenly. Incidentally, it's, there's an analogy here to the visual hallucinations which can occur with people who are losing their sight. Um, or for that matter, the olfactory hallucinations which can occur with people who lose their sense of smell. It's as if that part of the brain needs input. And if it doesn't have its input, then it'll generate an activity of its own. You can't, you can't have, have a, a vacant vacancy in the brain. Something has to happen. The emptiness has to be filled with, with imagery or hallucination, whatever it is. Um, the people who get musical hallucinations are often terrified as, as well as bewildered. They think, you know, hearing things, they're going crazy, schizophrenia. Um, the most crucial thing is to, after listening to the story, is to reassure people that these are not at all like psychotic hallucinations. You know, psychotic hallucinations, you usually have voices which accuse, uh, persecute, humiliate, cajole, whatever. Um, people with musical hallucinations, you know, and um, don't have this sort of thing. Their hallucinations are not addressed to one. They all have the feeling almost of something mechanical, a sort of regurgitation uh, um, of, you know, of early musical memories. One needs to do a sort of work up to find out what's happening. I mean, with Mrs. B, she had read that Lyme disease could sometimes produce musical hallucinations, that too much aspirin could. You know, she wondered if she'd had a stroke. She wondered many things. In fact, you know, it wasn't possible to turn up any problem, and she also wasn't deaf. Um, I saw her fairly recently, 10 years on. She still has them, but she's sort of fairly much at home with them now, and sometimes she will sing with them a little bit. Uh, she's also tried to teach herself new, new hallucinations. Um, uh, I find one of the most amazing letters, this is someone I haven't been able to see because he's a violinist in New Zealand, um, very good professional violinist. He has musical hallucinations and he may even have them while he's playing at a concert, uh, but, but his power focuses as such that he's able to continue performing while hallucinating something quite different. Um, they can also occur in children. I saw one nine-year-old boy 
and by description, his father said that when he was four, the boy would sit, sitting at the back of the car would sometimes scream and block his ears and ask for the car radio to be turned off when it wasn't on. Um, the, uh, again, I, um, I wonder whether with increasing deafness and more and more music around, there'll be more and more of these musical hallucinations. Um, I am getting fairly deaf myself and I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for them. Um, and, and also wondering what form they will take with me. Um, um, more rarely, there's some other negative powers of music. Some people may have epileptic seizures produced by music. Um, uh, one of my patients was found unconscious by the radio with a bitten tongue and all she could say was she'd been listening to some music, um, uh, some Neapolitan songs of which she was very fond. She's a Sicilian woman. And then she had a strange feeling and that was all she could remember. Not much attention was paid to the story, but then she had a second seizure also associated with a Neapolitan song. And in her case, Neapolitan songs and nothing else would produce seizures. Now, of course, you can avoid Neapolitan songs, <laughs> um, although it wasn't easy for her because she came from this big family from southern Italy and Sicily, and they were always being played. She said at a wedding, she would have about 30 seconds or 20 seconds to get out of range. She'd have to pluck her ears and run out. Um, if one did an EEG as we did, one could show that the convulsive activity started almost at once, but it took about 20 seconds to build up sufficiently to, to cause a seizure. Um, there was a, a music critic at the end of, in Russia at the end of the 19th century called Nikonov, and he had a first seizure during a Rimsky-Korsakov opera, well, you know, Rimsky-Korsakov um, opera, and he avoided Rimsky-Korsakov after that, but then it spread and more and more music affected him. And finally, if he heard a military band in the street, he would have to block his ears and run for the nearest doorway. And then he had to leave Moscow with its music and go to a, a village where there was only the lowing of cows and the quacking of, of geese. And there he wrote a little book called Fear of Music, which is a very strange book about musicogenic epilepsy. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to mention this. It's sort of really very obscure, but um, it just came into my mind. Um, now, I should have been watching the time, but I haven't. And, but I suspect that I you know, ought to wind up in some sort of way. Um, I just touched on a few subjects. Um, in my book, there are 29 sections and if you want, I can talk about the other 23. Uh, but, um, I mean, which includes such things as absolute pitch um, of synesthesia, when people, for example, may see colors or taste tastes as they hear music. Um, a strange thing called Williams syndrome, where the people affected with it are deeply defective and retarded in some ways, but have exceptional verbal and musical powers and, uh, and all get enraptured by music. Um, I've also written about people who suddenly develop um, musical taste and talent after one thing or another, and other people who suddenly lose it. Um, but um, uh, I think I should... Um, uh, um, prior to the 1970s, um, one found almost no reference to music in neurology or psychology books. Um, and um, I think one reason was that people didn't bring out any musical complaints, and if they did, they weren't musically tested, and people regarded music as, as trivial. Um, in the last 15 years or so, it's become possible with functional brain imaging to look at the brain in detail as people are listening to music, imagining music, hallucinating music, composing music, rearranging it in their mind. 
and uh, one is beginning to see that a huge amount of the human brain is involved with music one way and another and, and that we really are sort of a, a musical species. And, um, and unlike Steven Pinker, I think music is absolutely necessary to us and we couldn't survive without it, although it is a very odd thing. Okay, thank you.